In this brief talk, I want to think through some of the potential implications, applications of artificial intelligence in school level education. Predicting the future of schooling is a notoriously difficult thing to do, and there's a very real danger that one's predictions look very, very silly in the future. So here we have something from 1910 of the school teacher taking printed knowledge and having, I don't know, is that a prefect or something, grinding that up and then beaming that through some sort of digital means into the heads of these other students there. That was a prediction for what education would look like in 2000, and thankfully we were spared that. What about this, though? The school of the future, a push-button education of, I don't know, students watching some large screen at the front of the room, responding to individual questions on their own individual devices there. That far removed from what's happening? I think the flying helicopter chairs outside are rather further distant from the present than what we see inside the room here. Similar thing from Alan Kay back in 1982. Again, it doesn't look that different from a classroom of today, I don't think, with, with people, students, pupils, looking at large screens and responding on their own individual devices. I love the Atari sponsorship there. And, of course, one pupil who's not using his device for the purpose for which it was intended. What about homework? Again, work is set, work is done. Students respond on screen to work set on screen. Not that far different from the present. Interestingly, in all of these situations, we have something which looks very, very similar to a teacher, to somebody setting work. And so Arthur C. Clarke's threat that any teacher that who could be replaced by a computer should be has yet to take um, effect, I don't think. And I think if we think about the future, it's very hard to see how every aspect of a teacher's role is something that could be automated. Perhaps when it comes to setting work or marking work, yes, but there's much else that we do which would make it very difficult. So um, Oxford University have the how likely is it that a robot, some sort of digital automated system, will take your job. Primary and nursery teachers, very unlikely, 9% chance of that happening. And secondary school teachers, interestingly, even less likely, a 1% chance was predicted for them. Um, I'd have it the other way around, actually. I think that it's far, far less likely that many aspects of the primary or nursery teacher's role is something that could be automated. If you do a Google image search for teaching robots, yes, you do see robots taking on the role of a teacher, but you also see a lot more images of human beings teaching robots that at the present state of machine learning, of artificial intelligence, we're thinking much more about how to teach the robot, how to teach the machine how to do something, than the robots or the machines actually taking us. So for a little while yet, I think it's likely that we won't be replaced by artificial intelligences as teachers. We might, though, be able to draw on the artificial intelligence machines to support us in our role. And perhaps one mo particularly obvious way is as access to information, that installing the um, Google Assistant or Amazon's Alexa or Apple's Siri in your classroom or on your devices provides one means of accessing information, one way of drawing on that which we know as a civilization, the ability to ask questions not just of the pupils in your class but of the internet in this way and to get them to ask questions in this way I think is very interesting. Another aspect I think is a support for inclusion and this I think is tremendously exciting that children who would otherwise find it very difficult to participate in a lesson are able to do so because of the benefits which machine learning artificial intelligence have brought. I swap over here um, to uh, Google Docs and click on the um, voice typing tool and I can just talk in a normal voice at a normal pace to the computer. It listens to what I say and transcribes my words from these phonemes, the things that I'm speaking, into graphemes, the things that you can read on screen. You can do this as captioning during a presentation, so your pupils could have a transcript there on screen of what you're saying. Think how useful that would be for the hearing impaired child. Think how useful it would be for the child who finds it difficult to get their ideas down on paper to be able to just to talk to their computer and have their words transcribed. Think of children with dyslexia and how they would benefit from a tool such as this. 
which is great. So I can take that, of course, and then I can uh, translate that. So we can have translate the document from this into, let us say, Portuguese. Oops. And then appearing on screen very shortly, we have a translation of what I just said, or at least what the machine heard me say, into something which I hope would be understandable to the native Portuguese speaker. We have further accessibility tools, so we can have it speak a selection of this text here. Speak, speak selection. No, that's not going to work. I think I've got too many services running at the same time on the machine. So accessibility is tremendously helpful. Another thing which teachers do, of course, is to give feedback to their students. Cambridge English, they write an improved thing. You choose a topic, you write about that in English, and then a machine learning system comes in, reads what you've written, and gives you instant feedback on your words there and suggests ways in which you could improve on that. So similar to giving feedback is, of course, assessing students' work. And we've been able to do this with multiple choice and short response questions for a long time now, we're getting to the point where we can do this with essay questions, that a panel of examiners, a panel of assessors, marks a sample of, let's say, over a thousand scripts. We feed that into a machine learning system which looks at the characteristics of the original scripts, looks at the grades that they were given, and forms the model which translates the characteristics of the script into the final grade that's awarded. Once we have that, then we can just automate the whole process with everything after the first thousand or so scripts. All of the scripts can be th thrown into the machine learning system and the grade comes out at the end. I know very, very few teachers who particularly enjoy marking work and so being able to get that sort of automated grading and indeed the immediate feedback on your essay could be tremendously helpful. So automated essay um, uh, automated um, essay scoring is already available. This, 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 this tool to assess a long-form written piece of work and come up with a grade for it, although it uh, turns out that it's not quite as reliable as we would like it to be yet. It is rather thrown by particularly long essays. They seem to score very highly, so perhaps we might need to install some more constraints. Another aspect of assessment is spotting cheating. Um, give, we've for a long time now been able to use services such as Turnitin to be able to detect where words in an essay match words elsewhere on the internet. That's fine, you know, that's a useful anti-plagiarism measure to deter that sort of copy and paste cheating. And of course what we see now is contract cheating, where somebody pays somebody else via a service for an entirely original essay, which that sort of <clears throat> similarity checking service won't spot. But we can take the machine learning tools a stage further and do stylometric analysis to say here we have a body of a student's work which we know they wrote themselves, here is something which we are very suspicious of, is it written in the same style as the preceding documents? And so Turnitin's new stylometric service allows us to do that. So we have marking work spotting that sort of plagiarism. We also, of course, have a big part of the teacher's role is setting work for young people, for their students to do. And again, we're starting to see where machine learning systems are making inroads into that, of being able to develop a very detailed profile for the learner and then be able to suggest what would be the appropriate next exercise, the next thing for them to do. Perhaps a little like Amazon or Netflix recommendation system you seem to have enjoyed, found these particular tasks challenging or these, chal these particular tasks that have helped you to learn, so why not try these next, and building up the learner's profile. Ruth Kelly, our former education secretary, as early as 2005, seeing that as her vision for online learning. It would be a digital space that's personalised, remembers what the learner is interested in, suggests relevant websites, alerts them to courses, learning opportunities that fit their need. And this is very much what we've seen from the likes of Pearson and Newton, of this ability to build up a very detailed profile of the learner and to use that as a way of suggesting what they should do next. Perhaps, if you would, a sort of GPS for learning, something that knows where the learner is at the moment, that detailed profile that has perhaps by the learner's own choice, or perhaps because of the education system, a particular destination in mind, and then uses everything it knows about the road system, about the route from here to there, to plot the best possible route for that individual learner. 
Other aspects of machine learning that we could use in school, in the classroom, this idea of predicting outcomes that given what we know about the learner already, where is, what grades are they likely to leave the school with, what's their flight path, as it's called in English schools, that's something which machine learning can be used to if we have that flight path and suddenly their performance drops below that level then are there ways of, er of early intervention of notifying teachers and school leaders that this learner has dropped below the expected path that we would ex that we would hope that they would be on this is something where a person needs to go in and talk to that learner about how they could improve about how they could turn things around and of course you could do this at school level by looking at the performance data from individual schools. Where is a school dipping below what we would expect it to be doing? And we're starting to see this here with our education inspectorate in England of them using machine learning systems to look at school performance data and say where a school's current performance is dipping below the level at which it was previously assessed during um, education inspections. I think one of the most exciting developments is this idea of the virtual teaching assistant. We're seeing this already in higher education with increasingly smart chatbots which look for patterns in the questions, which look for key, key words and similar words in the phrases that they are asked and then respond with the appropriate information. Uh, Jill Watson at Georgia Tech, I think, is the most famous example of this. And Jill was, was graded as much more helpful than most of the human teaching assistants because she responded in a very timely way and always gave exactly accurate information. Um, I think having assistant, virtual assistants working alongside teachers is something which very few of us in the profession would actually feel is a threat to our job. Um, with all of those things though, with that spotting of interventions, with that providing support for students, with that tailoring of the pathway, with that idea of marking work, there is an interesting question about what jobs, what aspects of the job are left. And I think this is about helping our pupils to become more 